You ended up making your next movie in France. Had it become impossible to work in the United States? Um, I did. How it became impossible because I knew once I was named as a subversive that I understood the blacklist had, had, had by that time been well entrenched. There was no no work, and um, people avoided you. Friends would pretend they didn't see you, and I had a family to feed. And I was offered a film in. Uh, France, a film with the actor, their great comic actor's name is Fernandel, and I grabbed it, leaped at it. A few days before, no, about a week before, we were to shoot, the actress whom we had hired, an American actress, came weeping, said, I have been told if I work with Mr. Dasson, I will never get a job in America again. And so I'm obliged to leave. Excuse me, I'm out. And this gave the producer a little bit of shock. But I said, well, we, we can cast that again. We, and we began to do that. And then he got another uh, message from a man whose name I'll tell you. No, his name, I'll never forget it. Mr. Roy Brewer who was the president of the Technicians Union in, the, in California. And his message to the producer was that uh, if you make this film with Mr. Dasson, it will never see a release in the States, nor will any film you ever make from then on be released in the States. And they took this threat seriously, and I was out of a job. And that went on for about four years, until Rififi came up. And Rififi is just a, a, a brilliant, now classic, um, heist yes. movie. And let me read something Francois Truffaut said about it. He said, out of the worst crime novel I have ever read, <laughs> Jules Dassin has made the best film noir I have ever seen. Um, were you skeptical of making the novel into a movie? Did you dislike the, the novel as much as Truffaut did? I was not enchanted by it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a job. You wanted to work. And there was just this section of the in the novel, uh, which was about a, a heist, a, ho a robbery, and I decided to make the film a, build it around that. So all of the themes, ideas, and some racist notions in the book, I did not have to face. As a matter of fact, I became friends with the writer, the author of the book later on. Um, but it was so glorious and wonderful to work again after five years. So, I, I guess the yeah. exhilaration of working again is part of what oh, we're boy. seeing in in the movie. I hope so. I, I, I would be glad if that were true. The, the most famous scene in Rafifi is the actual jewelry heist. This is a scene of um, close to 30 minutes. There's, yes. n there's no dialogue and there's no music no. as these guys work without making a sound. That's right. Um, why did you shoot it without dialogue or music? I just f felt it that way, and I think it came from my trust in the characters as written and as played. They had no no need to talk or communicate. They they were professionals. They knew each other. They anticipated each other, and they knew that noise was an enemy. Noise was dangerous, and they worked quietly efficiently, and in touch with each other, the contact that was very strong. And uh, it worked better in the silence. Now, most filmmakers, I think, would have put music underneath, suspense music or some kind of music. Oh, I think then you've heard my story, a story. There's a wonderful um, composer, 
in French history, as a matter of fact, whose name is Georges Auric, who also did film work. He's written some marvelous stuff for movies. And um, he said, I look forward to writing uh, music for this huge sequence. And I said, no, I don't want music. He said, you're mad. You're mad. And the producer said, you're mad. You're going to go 30 minutes without t dialogue, without music? I said, that's what I hope. And he said, look, I'm your friend. I'm going to cover you. I'm going to write the music. I said, I don't want it. I'm going to write it. And he did, almost a symphony. And this wonderful guy, I invited him. I said, come to screening. I'm going to show you the film once with music and once without music. And I want you to tell me what you think I should do. And he sat through both versions and he said, music out. <laughs> A wonderful guy. Now, do you think that audiences early on realized that there was no sound and oh, no yes, dialogue? Indeed. Or did it just work on them unconsciously? Well, um, I trapped them a little bit. Because there was one sound I did make. The guy accidentally touches a piano key. And when I saw that with an audience and they gasped, when he made that sound, I said, okay, we're in. They don't want him to make him any noise. <laughs> if you're just joining us, my guest is film director and actor Jules Dassin. Um, I'm going to quote Francois Truffaut. He wrote, The relative permissiveness of the French censors allowed Dassin to make a film without compromises, immoral perhaps, but profoundly tragic, warm, human. Now, I think the one of the immoral quote parts that he's referring to is, is a scene in which the main character, Le Stéphanois, played by Jean Servais, has just gotten out of prison, and he discovers that his old girlfriend is now with his enemy. So he punishes her by forcing her to strip, then whipping her with a belt, and throwing her out the door before she can zip her dress back up. We never see her undressed, nor do we see him actually whip her. We just hear it. And we also see how disgusted he is by his own act when he's through whipping her. How did you decide how to shoot that scene? Well, may I uh, correct one thing? Yeah. He did not come to punish an enemy. He didn't even know who the man was. Uh, when he went to prison, this woman, very, very sympathetic character, as a matter of fact, just had to take up another life and um, survey the character who was prison, uh, I thought, felt, as, as did the actor, that he, he behaved uh, cruelly, but that's the way that he would behave. And it was, the cruelty was suggested more than seen. Right. As a matter of fact, none, not, not a single scratch or blow was was filmed. It, it, just not, it was suggested. But I understand that, that the movie ended up on the Legion of Decency list of, of movies to avoid and that it was actually censored in some countries. Look, um, the Legion of Decency, uh, I'm convinced, treated it that way because my name was on the film. Right. My, uh, you know, I, something I have a, some pride about was that after people who needed work, friends, blacklisted people, people, talent people that I knew about, had to work under false names. And, and I just... When Rififi was seen by American uh, uh, distributors, it had already opened in Europe and was uh, very successful, L made a lot of money. And producers of the States, distributors, came to me and offered me a lot of money if I would remove my name from the film and put up some false name that I refused, and uh, that was the first 
film made by a former blacklisty that had the director's name on it. This is credited to my dear friend uh, uh, Dalton Trumbo, who made Spartacus. Right, that's the story I always hear. No, but that came after Fee, mm -hmm. considerably later. And with my name on it, all we got at the beginning was one theater in New York, <laughs> one. Uh, but it opened and was very successful, and so some other theaters took it up. But it got very limited distribution at the time. I know you acted in the Yiddish theater in New York before you even directed. What kinds of parts did you play in the Yiddish theater? <laughs> I actually played one speaking part uh -huh. because I was an apprentice in that theater. Um, and I played the lead in one part because I was the understudy. And um, I stepped in and I was great. And then the next day... I was terrible. And the third day, I was just inadmissible. And I said, oh, my God, you mean one has to do this every night? <laughs> I said, no more actors for me. And that's when I decided to go in another direction. Was Yiddish your first language? Well, actually, it's very strange. Um, my mother and father were Jewish, but my father insisted that we speak in English. And so I did, I spoke sub-Yiddish, but not well. But when I saw that theater and said, I want to be in this theater, because I think it was a great theater called the Artef, marvelous, wonderful theater with a brilliant director, a man whose name is Benno Schneider. And I said, oh, I was a boy, I was very young, but I said, I want to be part of this theater. And part of it was studying Yiddish. Oh. I spent five, almost five, six years in that theater. A happy, happy time. My guest is film director Jules Dassin. This is fresh air. My guest is film director Jules Dassin. Now, Jules Dassin, you, um, two, two of your best known movies, uh, Never on Sunday and Top Cappy, uh, starred Melina Mercouri, who, uh, also, you, you were married to for, for many years. She, she passed yes. away in 1994. Um, mm. And uh, she became Minister of Culture in Greece, but before that had happened, she was exiled for several years after a military coup. And then she, right. she was voted into Parliament, then she became Minister of Culture. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you become a couple before you started working together, or did you become a couple through working together? Uh, both. <laughs> uh, uh, she, uh, at a Cannes Festival in 1954 or 50, 55, uh, Melina came with a film re representing Greece, a film called Stella, and uh, I came representing France with Rififi. And uh, we met there. And I admired her performance very much in Stella. That was the title of the film. And um, I was preparing an, another film called He Who Must Die, in which there's a part that I thought she would be perfect for. And I told her about that, and that's how our life began. What was her image in Greek movies before Never on Sunday, in she which she, all, she played um, a, she a kind of earthy prostitute? In Never on Sunday? Yeah. Yeah. She had made only that one film before, this film Stella, the first film she ever made. Oh. That's all she had. It was her first movie. So you, you kind of discovered her in a way. Well, the man who made Stella discovered her, but uh, she was a very important uh, star in the Greek theater. Now, you've continued to live in Greece. Mm -hmm. um, what do you like about living in that country? I guess your family is there now. No. My family is in Paris. But, you know, we see each other. My daughters are here with me now, right outside your studio door. Um, 
But, um, you know, this dictatorship that you referred to lasted seven years. In, in Greece? Yeah, it lasted seven years. And uh, for Melina to be cut away from Greece, which she passionately loved, she loved everything Greek. If you had a Greek name, she loved you. She was a nationalist, a jingoist, a chauvinist, whatever, whatever came to Greek, she loved. And for her to be away was very serious punishment. And when the junta fell, I happened to be in New York on the day it happened. And Melina was in Paris. And she said, I'm going back tomorrow. Think of what you're going to do and let me know. And I had said to myself, now, I'm thinking of my work mostly. My Greek was practically non-existent, limited. And I had to decide quickly what I would do the rest of my life. But I knew what Greece meant to Melina. She had to be there. And I knew what she meant to me, so I had to be with her. And that was the decision. I went to live in Greece. Well, Jules Dessen, thank you for talking with us. Thank you for visiting New York. Enjoy talking to you. And I wish you the best. Thank you. Film director Jules Dassin, last week he flew to New York for a film retrospective featuring his late wife, Melina Mercury. It runs at the Film Forum in Manhattan through October 18th. He will appear at the Harvard Film Archive October 11th, where they're doing a tribute to Mercury and Dassin. I'm Terry Gross.